<laughs> I already forgot what I was gonna say. And then, and, 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 okay, I know. In today's video, we're going to explore the various ways to use connectors in your patchwork designs. Let's get cracking. One of the things that you probably are, are going, what is a connector? How does that work and what does that mean? I'll bet I can help you with that. In the industry, there are probably 10 different ways this unit is currently referred to. Some call it flippy corners, cheater corners, a cut and sew or flip and sew. The reason I call it the connector method is my good friend Mary Ellen Hopkins designed this method back in the late 70s and 80s, long, even actually before we had a rotary cutter, and loads of issues came with, with trying to sew accurate connectors. So Mary Ellen is the one that came up with the idea that if I laid a corner on a square and sewed through the middle of that corner and folded it back, in essence, it looked like a triangle but I didn't have to deal with bias. I didn't have to deal with any specific anything. Because for any of you who knew Mary Ellen and was ever in her presence, you know that she was one who referred to, she didn't give a rats about a quarter of an inch seam allowance. She just called it your PPM, your personal private measurement. So for Mary Ellen, everything was about getting the job done and getting it done easy. For many, many years, I worked with Mary Ellen and I also saw the value of connectors because our equipment wasn't as good at that time as it is today. So the accuracy factor of our equipment has made new methods be a little bit more desirable for me, but I still regularly will use connectors in certain applications. If you bought any of my earlier books, they would have 99% been connectors to avoid the old 7 8 of an inch and, and trying to deal with that. When we first began this new this journey, not very many of the rulers even had an eighth of an inch marking on them. So to try to cut a two and seven eighths inch square was like trying to climb a mountain because you couldn't, because you didn't even have an eighth of an inch marking on your tool. This is the reason that I'm gonna start with some of the easiest things that I think you can design with. And I could sew all day long with connectors. So the first quilt we're going to take a look at is a little quilt that I call Dugouts in Bloom. And as you look at this on your on the overhead, and I isolate one little tiny square right here. This entire design is done with one square and two connector corners. One square and two connector corners. Now, right now, somebody's out there going, what size square? Now, remember, I've told you guys, I'm not unwilling to tell you what size I did. What I'm trying to get you to understand is my job is to give you the technique. How do I do this successfully? Your job then is to decide how big you want that square to be. The math starts with the size of the square. So once you say, I got a bunch of four inches, there's your math then we get busy. So this little quilt is a combination of arranging those to create a different look. This is your the first project sheet that we'll be looking at. How do I begin to design with this unit? When I'm working with the unit called a dugout, and this block is typically referred to as a Kansas dugout. Don't ask me why, probably somebody in Kansas came up with it, but that's how a lot of the historians reference this little element. All it is, is a square with two triangles in the corner. There are many ways to do this. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to do it with the connector method. So I choose a base square. Then the corners triangle for me typically is half of what that square is. That's usually the math that I work with. So let's say I cut a four inch square. Well, let's say I cut a four and a half. It'll be, math will be easier. Then half of finished four is two. So I'd cut a four and a half inch base, and then I'd cut a two and a half inch corner. So I have to, I have, to have two methods. I have to have a corner and a base. So once I've decided on the size, regardless of what it is, choose it, whatever it finishes, half it, and that's typically what I use. The only thing I'm going to do 
is to fold this little unit and put it on the corner. So it's going to end up looking something like this as I'm planning. Now the very first question I get when, when I would teach this technique is, I just don't have any success sewing those because it's difficult. And I would agree with you that it is fraught with problems if you are not a real clean sewer and you have decent markings. So I'll show you three different ways to mark that corner and then you choose the one that works the best for you. And honestly, I recommend that you just practice sewing some odd squares on some other odd squares just till you get this technique down. So one of the methods, I actually went to the iron with this and I pressed this in half like that. Then when I lay this down on this square to sew it, I have a clear marked center line. I can, and I typically will always press this wrong sides together because when I open it, then that little valley lets my needle ride down just like that. So I can choose to press it, but let me tell you, if you got a hundred of these, that's a whole lot of time at the iron and I'm a tad lazy about that. The other thing that I can do is I can just simply draw a fine line across this. That's still a whole lot of trouble for me because it means I got to pick everyone up. I got to lay a ruler down there and I got to do it. Let's sew one and I will show you how I mark it by simply putting a line on my sewing machine table from my needle out to my body. And yes, I know that you can buy, there are tools that you can buy that you affix to the top of your machine, and I'm not opposed to that, but I, for those of you with top-loading bobbins, if you do that, then you've got to change it every time you have a top-loading bobbin, and I just think I have more control when I do one of these three methods. I am not suggesting you can't use a fourth or fifth method. These are my favorites, and then you choose your favorite. Okay, I'm going to sew this one with the method of the line marked on my sewing machine. And let's just, I start right at the tip, and now I'm gonna to sew to that tip. I'm gonna pick up my second one, and here's the thing that I want you to see on camera, is typically you would do this. But look how awkward that is. All you have to do is turn that, And I sewed this one on purpose this way so you could see by not being spot on that point, when you fold it back, it doesn't line up with the base, which is why Mary Ellen used to say, never cut the base off, only cut the middle out, and then when you join it, you use your base, not that. So the key is point to point, if you are off this much, when you fold this back, it will not line up. See how clean now your dugout block is? As opposed to no, yes. This entire quilt is nothing but that one block. That's all this first little quilt, Dugouts in Bloom, is. Now I put two different color colored corners on it. Depending on the design that I want when I use this as a standalone border, in this little quilt, I'm using it as the block. But if I'm using it as a standalone border, I might want two different colors, one on the inside and one on the outside. But let's take a look at a little quilt I just did this last week, actually. 
Look at this cute little thing. Now this I did from the pattern. I mean, it, it was the same concept as the little quilt that is your project sheet. This is not a project sheet, but it's exactly the same components. This is Ricky Tim's hand dyed fabrics. I was just with Ricky this last week and I tell you, I might have stole this. I don't remember for sure. Don't tell him I said that. I got this entire project out of one yard of one of his hand dyes. And I just made this little center and then I put it with one of my real early Victorian fabrics, which I thought the mix of the fabrics was fun. And then when I got all done, I thought, okay, that's it. And then I went, oh, I want a dugout border. So that's when I came back and punished myself by selecting a stripe for my corners. Let me tell you. I think the look is incredibly dramatic, but when you decide to do this, if you are someone that is bothered by things changing direction, one north, south, one east, west, don't do it. But it was worth it for me because I wanted to see how this would all work. It's really dramatic with this black and white. And then I ended up and decided that I wanted to do a dugout border. That's where I think this block is so dramatic to have in your library when you really need to put a killer border on a simple quilt is you use it. Now, let me give you a little key on map. When you look at this whole picture, you'll see that the corners are symmetrical in the way they wrap around this. In other words, they turn just perfectly. What that means is there must be an even number of dugout blocks on each side and the top and bottom. So let's say your math is something that you can only get seven out of. Well, you're gonna have an issue with turning the corners. So I want four, six, eight, 10, or 12 elements when I turn the corner because that gives me that really clean circle look that I get with this. And that's how I ended up and finally decided that I just had to put this little border on there. Now look at these little baby triangles. You know what those are from this? These are the back corners that I cut off. So if you cut clean, you can re-sew these little units as triangles and who knows, I could come up with another border if I wanted to. So make your decision prior to your cutting so that you know you want to be a clean cut so that you can retrieve those, those little triangles. And the larger your connector corner is, the more likely you will be able to utilize those. Now let's take a look at this little quilt. Now the body of the quilt is a Gretchen. It, it is not something that's part of this program as far as how it's designed, but I love the fact that you can clearly see what happens when you have, like the sides are even and the top and bottom are odd or vice versa. Then I'm going to have an element. It doesn't bother me. I just want you to know it's gonna happen and that you're, that you're able to deal with it. I like it where the top, goes this way and then the bottom curls around and it looks like part of a design choice. But it's all gonna depend on is your quilt a 48 by 52 or whatever it is and does it divide by a number? And this is where a lot of people get all tied up in, how do I know whether what it's supposed to be? Just measure your quilt. If you add a border on there and you measure the quilt, if you don't like the measurements, you've got to trim some of the border off in order to get it to a number that divides evenly. Now, remember when I showed you, let's look at this one little square right here, this one. If you look at this, and I remember I showed you that little one that had two different corners on it, look how much more bang I get when I have an inner border that matches one connector and an outer border that matches another connector, this is three times as dramatic as it would be if I had just used the same thing. Because now I get another pattern when we look at the entire quilt. One of the other real values of connectors, and especially in the early days, was we did all of our flying geese with connectors. So we did a base rectangle and two squares, and that's how 95% of my early books or patterns we're using this method. I don't use it often, but when I need it, I do use it. And I encourage you to know this technique. I can do these plain flying geese. The only thing I need is a base rectangle and two squares. 
So you know when you're working with a base rectangle, we want a rectangle that's a pure rectangle. So a two by four, a three by six, a one by two, then add the seam allowances. So let's say a two by four, which is what these are. I would cut my base rectangle two and a half by four and a half, and I would cut my corners the height of the rectangle. So if the rectangle is two and a half inches tall, then that's what the square is. So the only thing that I do then is determine the method of marking. I lay this down, I sew through, and I fold back. You can sew any size flying geese you want using this technique. So put that in your little library of, of patterns. Now, what else could I do, Kay, with that rectangle? If I had these exact same pieces, let's pull these two out of the way. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the term 3D flying geese. Again, I don't know who invented that. I do know for a fact it was in a Mary Ellen seminar that it first came to light. I do not know who laid claim to it, and Mary Ellen did not lay claim to inventing it, but she certainly used it. And it's a 3D flying geese, a three-dimensional, so that the goose remains unsewed down. And I, I still can't help but call them what Mary Ellen called them. She called them a loose goose. Because when that was not sewn down, it became a loose goose. So all I need is a base rectangle exactly like the previous one. I fold the rectangle in half. And then I put the fold at the top. And this is the way I've always explained it. And then I put the rectangle right sides touching. And I sandwich that rectangle between these two squares as if I'm making a cheese sandwich. So what I have is the raw edges south. The fold is dropped down and faces north. Once I've done that, I then choose to sew on either the right or the left side. It doesn't make any difference. Once you've made your sandwich, then you take it to the machine. And then that crease goes to the middle. And now I have a flying geese but he is dimensional. He is loose. I will tell you that it, this loose goose slash dimensional flying geese unit really comes in handy when you're doing some fun techniques on the borders. And yes, it is loose in there. So sometimes it creates a little bit of an issue if you're quilting, but I've used it a lot. Take a look at this quilt it's in my African book and it is nothing but three dimensional flying geese, the entire quilt. Let me tell you, it weighs a ton. It's no longer in my house. A friend of mine actually owns the quilt now. But you can make an entire project with a dimensional flying geese and or a connector method flying geese as well. Okay, now our next project sheet is this little quilt that I called, bless your heart. Now, if you're from the South, you know how important that little phrase is that you know, bless your heart. So, but this was actually some gift blocks to me. So there are a few of the blocks in this quilt that are signed and then I did some extra ones. And what's funny about it is you look at this quilt, that border is that same little Victorian border that I put in and partnered with Ricky's hand dyed fabric. I had an extra, a bolt or so of that and I love it anytime I need something that just has a boatload of colors in it. 
So, but let's break down this little block. We don't need to sew this because folks, you've done everything that's in it. The corners of this are two dugout blocks. So this corner and this corner is a dugout. That's a square, that's a rectangle, that's a square, that's a square, that's a rectangle. That's it. You also now know how to calculate your side set triangles. So when these were all done in order to square up, and anytime you do a friendship sharing of blocks, you'll need to maybe square up some of them or to add, make them all the same size. So I did put a little skinny border around them to bring them all back into the same size. Then I did my math for my side setting triangle based on that. This is just, a sweet little thing again by knowing that dugout element, look at the quilt that I got with it. Okay, now our third project sheet is called Royal Flush. I don't know, maybe I was in a gambling mood when that happened, but I will tell you this is a really sharp looking little quilt that is so easy it's not even funny. And I really would love to have a larger quilt of this. Maybe one of these days I'll do it. But as you see, it's very dramatic. It, I used one of my African collections and it's on a black ground so it could easily be done in any style. It's a bunch of nine patches and then it's the same height, it's three squares high rectangle with two little connectors on it. That is all this quilt is. Now one of the joining sashing strips would have a rectangle with connectors on both ends, but the design looks complex and it is nothing but that first time nine patch. And your little connectors that you learned today, could you change the size? Of course you could. It's strictly up to you. I did a little funky work with the borders, played around, did something asymmetrical and different fabrics. That's part of your playing and your design choices. Let's take a look at our next project. And this one is another bright one. You know, it's funny, I work traditional a lot. So when, it's, when I get a chance to work in these real bright colors, it's a lot of fun. And as you look at this quilt, it looks way more complex than the last one does. And you're like, oh, I don't know. How do I do all that border? This is another one that talks about the incorporated border that I've referred to that was a Mary Ellen technique. Well, a lot of people did it, but she kind of called it that, where you do a batch of components built around your block. The dugout is every other element in this incorporated border. So every time you see that little bullet element, that is your dugout block. And then it's followed by the little four patch block. So you put your four patch and your dugout together and they're turned on point. Then of course it means that the filler block is just a plain square equal to what those two elements was. The pattern is very specific on this. The breakout is very good and it's in it, it's just a single project sheet and it really looks way more difficult than it is. Now, the little element that lives inside is it starts its center out with my the four colors of, or the colors that I'm going to work with and that's a four patch and then next to that is two rectangles. So I have a four patch with two rectangles that form this block right here. So after you build the rectangles and the squares, then you've got the larger square is a nine patch. Square, rectangle, square, rectangle, four patch, rectangle, square, rectangle, square. That way, that's my block, and then I have filler elements that go in. This one is a little more complex for you to break down probably without a pattern, but again, it would be very easy to enlarge this quilt, change the color palette. Uh, again, I use funky borders and kind of change the scale, change the color, and when somebody says why, and I went, well, because I had it, so I just used it. So that is card tricks which is in your project sheets. Now, this is not one of the project sheets, but I couldn't possibly cover connectors if I didn't include the bow tie because that was one of Mary Ellen's little signature blocks. She did loads and loads of things with the bow tie. All the block is, is a four patch. So think back to day one when we made our four patches. And on the two of them, you cheat, you put a connector corner 
on two of them. And typically I want that connector corner to be the same fabric as the tie because that's what makes it look like it's a cute little bow tie. We have one of our little daily bread project sheets that I call bow tie pasta. It kind of wiggles a little bit like a pasta. I love the bow tie in its simplicity when all you have to do is lay out a four patch and put some corners on it. Now, this is the exact same pattern, size and everything, as the bow tie pasta, the actual block itself. But this was just a fun little, what I call leftover. It is simply the little bow tie right there, but it's tied, bow tie tied. So in other words, without quilting it or anything, just do some floss or a yarn or something and tied and again a cute little table topper a, a little doll quilt for a child or I guess for a little boy run his cars over to wait a minute so could a little girl so all it is is the bow ties in a staggered row in lieu of like the bow tie pasta the size of this doesn't matter for those of you who have AccuQuilt 11 1 and 12 1 are the dies that are in the cubes that would allow you to make a bow tie that size that your cube is. So whatever you own, whip out some bow ties that size. Now our last project sheet is a little quilt I call Twisted Sister. I didn't have a sister, so I suppose I could get away with saying that. I made this quite a few years ago and it's a little busy because I used a solid and I used a, a floral. The floral was my background and the green was my main. And the problem with that is it gets a little lost. Now I still like that kind of thing, but I think it was a lot of work without as much benefit. I like it better where there's a clean contrast between the background and the pieced block. So as you look at this, you're like, well, that's a little squirrely. Now, what is that? Well, the only tricky thing in this is this little element that lives in the middle right here. And actually, if we had made this a long time ago, it would have been a square, a half square, and another square. So one of the real perks of working with the connectors is quite often they eliminate some seams. So I got rid of these two seams. I just had to sew a diagonal. One of the things you have to pay attention to is if you organize these, then it'll go the opposite way. That wouldn't be an issue because that point can swing right or that point can swing left. Just choose one and be consistent throughout the blocks in order to get this repeat design because you're actually getting a bonus pattern because see, I've got three of these. So if I bring this one in, this one's not sewn yet. So if I bring that in, see how I get that little pattern? And then when I join this one, do you see how they offset each other? So I think I could make a really scrappy quilt. I, I believe I would keep my background the same. I've used three different ones just so you could see the different look, but I love these being scrappy. So instead of doing the two color like I did in the original quilt, I would encourage you to choose a background, then work out of your scrap basket for all these other little elements, and you actually get a mirror image block. When you look at the original quilt, you get, they build on each other. It's kind of like a tessellation, like Escher's tessellation, where you get all of these images that build on each other. And so you do get a big bonus with a pattern created by the background. So the background creates a sister block, which is often referred to as a tessellation design. That is the last in your project sheets, and I'm telling you folks, that ought to keep you busy for quite a while. I wanna share the, the quilt that I did in the Signature Scrap Series for Mary Ellen. I didn't feel like I could finish that pattern series without 
a tribute to her because she had such a role in me doing what I do today. And it's all things that Mary Ellen did that anyone who followed her and worked with her would recognize all of these elements. So let's take a look at my Ode to Mary Ellen. So on this little heart, and this is typically a Mary Ellen heart, it's a rectangle with two connector corners. It's a smaller unit with two connector corners making the heart. These little shooting stars are like a half of a dugout. It's a square with a connector. And so those form that little star. Here's a chunky bow tie. Here's the little evening star that is a rectangle well, it's a square with smaller units on it as connectors. And here is a nine patch. And as it builds down, the only thing I did is change my background color to form those diagonal lines, added a row of flying geese around, all done as connectors. And then I love the little border treatment where you use all these leftover pieces and join them like a binding and separates your colors. I love the way this turned out. It is all squares or rectangles to make this quilt and the little Ode to Mary Ellen is sistered up with the little bow tie pasta in a little package for you as a PDF. It's also available as a standalone if you like this little pattern. Okay, the last thing I wanna share with you is in 2001, we did a little book called Vintage Gathering. It has been out of print for a long time. It has seven projects in the book. Five of the seven can be done with the techniques that I showed you today. So I'm gonna share those five quilts with you. One of them will just be a full out because we didn't have room to hang them all. And if it is the first time that it will be available as a PDF. And it is as a PDF, as a standalone, so it's not in with the package or anything because it is the first time we've ever put this book on. So let's take a look at those quilts. The first quilt you're gonna be looking at is Carson Square. It looks a little more complicated than it is, but everything in it is either a partial flying geese, connectors, this is a bow tie block, and it's sashed completely different. It really is a complex looking quilt to be made with those simple little blocks we just executed. Now the next little quilt, the colors will be a little different uh, on this one than the one that you're seeing the large quilt on. This is one with 30s, it's called Patch Stars. And it again is the little patch centers that, that we built day one. And then the connector flying geese. And this is a good point to say, for those of you who are, are successful at making flying geese another method, you can make that alteration if you choose to, but we're trying to show you how many things you can do with just squares and corners on those squares, like snowballs or whatever. Now this next one is English Garden, and it's a quilt I would call close contrast, and it was a fabric collection at the time, but it's got the repeating stripe as the separator. And then this is just the block with the side set triangle that you already know how to calculate. And this could be done any method, but in the pattern, it is written as a connector, just like we showed you today. Now, as you look at the Threads of Tradition quilt, the one you're looking at is a different pattern than this one, because I've made this quite a few times. I've taught this in classes. It's a row of flying geese that's done as connectors. It's a nine patch. And then it's got a little a triangle in a square. All of that is done as a connector in the pattern, even though I have other methods of doing it. Now this, this next quilt that we're looking at is actually the fifth one of the seven in the book that you can do as connectors only. And the quilt is no longer in my possession, but I love this quilt. And it again is done as a connector only. So while you may have other methods to adapt to it, this is five of the seven that should give you weeks and weeks of sewing pleasure with the simple little elements that we did today.